Hello and welcome to Trading Hour. It's 11 a.m. this Tuesday morning. I'm Surabhi Upadhyay and with me is uh, Hormaz. And what we've got is a weak looking screen once again where India is underperforming a lot of the regional markets. It's not been good the last couple of days. The market's made a bit of a habit of selling off from the highs and we've got a sell off going on right now, especially in the broader markets. Watch that mid cap index. It's down 1%. Hormaz, good morning. Good morning, Surbhi. And it's not a good morning for the market at all because, and as you said, it's becoming habit, right? That you're opening higher, but you're failing to sustain at the highest point of the day. Now, you can pull up the Nifty as well. The Nifty is down 200 points from the day's high. There you can see there, almost 22,500. It's struggling to cross that 22,500 mark for almost three sessions now. And it's now almost at 22,350, which is set to be a very crucial near-term support. Now, the Nifty Bank as well, that is leading the underperformance, actually. It's down almost 600 points from the day's high. As much as early as last week, we were talking of 50,000 on the Nifty Bank. And now, we are all almost struggling to hold on to even 48,000, so a percent lower on the Nifty Bank as well, almost what, 15, 1,600 points down from that record high of 49,975 that we had made on the index. The PSU banks, those continue to bleed. They were down, the index was down 4% yesterday. PSU bank index lost 57,000 crores in market cap yesterday considering the fall and it is extending that drop now another percent and a quarter in today's session. What is also the only solace though is FMCG. Yeah. And it's almost tragic because when the <laughs> markets were rallying, we all kept complaining that FMCG is not participating yeah. in the rally and now that the FMCG index is up, the market is taking a bit of a beating. But FMCG, as we said, is almost 3% higher in price. Absolutely. Uh, you know, Hormaz, even for me, uh, the, the breadth of the fall is a little concerning on the Nifty and beyond the Nifty. So the breadth in terms of market capitalization, because it's almost all encompassing, uh, the uh, you know the Nifty is down, the Bank Nifty is down, the mid cap index is falling one percent as we just told you. The small cap index is lower. That's the market breadth, which is uh, you know pretty weak. Uh, and then also the nature of stocks, the sectors, because barring FMCG, nothing is holding up in this market today, and that that's really telling in terms of the weakness. So whether you're looking at big stocks like uh, you know a Reliance or something like an ICICI Bank or an Axis Bank, whether you're looking at some of these uh, commodity names on the metal side, on the oil and gas side, I mean, JSW Steel would be an example there. Uh, there's Hindalco as well. Uh, or you're looking at the PSU complex. The PSU complex was the strongest part of this market where there was a constant buy on dips that was playing out. But that has reversed in the last couple of sessions. So let's uh, keep a close watch on it. But, uh, you know, that's the market. We'll see if it changes. Hormuz, I do want to start off at least with slightly happier things. And by that, I mean a lot of the chatter now that's gained ground. I think after the, uh, the NSC, uh, you know, earnings call, that perhaps we won't have longer trading hours. So <laughs> let's focus on that. <laughs> that's music to our ears, isn't it? At least to a lot of us, it's music yeah. to our ears. And I'm sure for a lot of others on the street as well. But uh, as, you, as Surabhi was highlighting, right, NSC CEO Ashish Chauhan, during the analyst call, mentioned that SEBI has returned its plea to increase trading time. Now, stockbrokers seem to have not given the feedback that market regulator SEBI was anticipating. Now, to discuss more on this, let's in fact hear into first what Ashish Chauhan had to say on the conference call yesterday before we get to our guests. Currently, there is no plan to increase the timings as uh, SEBI has uh, returned back the uh, application which uh, we had uh, provided because the stock broker seemed to have not given the feedback that SEBI wanted. So, as of now, the uh, extended uh, time frame uh, is shelved. Okay, uh, we've got uh, two market participants now joining in to give us their feedback on this. Dina Mehta, Managing Director at Asit C. Mehta Investment Intermediaries and Dheeraj Reli, MD and CEO at HDFC Securities. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining in. Uh, so you tell us, I mean, how are your teams reacting to this and should we consider this as final? That this whole proposal of extending trading hours, should we think that this is now permanently sort of off the table? Uh, Mr. Reli, let me open with you. What's, uh, what's your reaction? I think it's no means not yet. That's how I should go about it. Uh, I know that SEBI has uh, rejected the plea. And as of now, brokers are divided and they feel that the times are not right probably for extended hours. But my personal take is that it eventually after calibration, it will happen over a period of time. Right. But never say never, as you said, Mr. Ellie. But Ms. Mehta, I wanted to get your uh, opinion on this. That, okay, for now, that proposal is off the table with making all the adjustments and technical know-hows. 
but the major simple question is is this even a realistic proposal to have a trading day of almost 18 19 hours is this even realistic to be put in place i mean talking about realistic there are so many things which are happening in the market which are not realistic and, uh, and you know it's a whole trial and error process going on like if you look at t plus zero I mean, it's, a, it's just a trial and error. So, you know, this whole culture of uh, working out a cost-benefit analysis, tabulating it, uh, and saying that, yes, this is how much the market will benefit out of this chain. I think that uh, process uh, is uh, somehow uh, not very much uh, used uh, in our uh, system. And from that point of view, and I don't think because stock brokers are divided. I mean, so many decisions have been taken. Those stock brokers have not been in favor of it. But I feel the underlying uh, uh, reason why this has not been done is essentially, I mean, if you look at the amount and the volume of trading, they are all happening in derivatives and options in particular. And, and this has made a lot of, and coupled with uh, the kind of brokerages, no brokerage and... Uh, this whole, uh, you know, uh, idea of not charging brokerage or charging 10 rupees or whatever, that has led to, uh, you know, investors uh, indulging into frequent trading because the cost involved is very less. And that could again lead to increase in, um, increase in uh, derivatives trading and, and having a lopsided market of so little happening in cash segment and so much happening on derivative segment. I think that is the main reason why you know these extended trading hours uh, uh, has not gone through and i think uh, it is a rightful decision uh, because uh, if we are only going to increase volumes in options and derivatives and if people are just going to you know speculate and not really invest in the markets and you see the number of people uh, who are really participating hardly one or two crores would be participating in cash market and the people who participate in derivatives run into a few lakhs. So I feel that, um, uh, and as rightly said by my colleague, that yes, uh, this is not yet. And uh, of course, as time goes and nothing is, uh, you know, stationary or final. Yes, so sir. Yeah. That's a really interesting point you've raised, raised Ms. Mehta, that perhaps in some way this ties into the whole rise in FNO volumes and whether retail is speculating too much or not. Uh, Mr. Delhi, come in on this. Do you think this separate trend, and we know SEBI's views very, very clearly on it when they went and said that, you know, 90% of people lose money in FNO. So the, regula the regulator's views on excessive speculation in futures and options is well known. Do you think there's a link between the two? Is that one reason why uh, perhaps this has been junked for now? Yeah, absolutely. At this time, I think uh, there is a direct correlation that a derivative trading is, see, is seen as excessive speculation, for sure. I think the data substantiated it. Uh, we all provided that data to SEBI and exchanges that 9 out of 10 customers are not making money. And uh, this is leading to more and more speculation. So that is having an overweighing uh, thoughts on the SEBI's mind. And of course, as a regulator, they need to be cognizant of the same that how individual investors, uh, whether they are making money or not, and how they are pegged against the uh, high-frequency traders and uh, institutional players. So to that extent, yes, it is having its own weight uh, on the minds of the regulator. But my take is that that's true for even 375 minutes of the trading hours that are available even now also. So uh, if we need to address the speculation piece, uh, excessive speculation piece, there are different measures one need to work on and not just the mix these two things. Uh, extended hours are more for the, you know, uh, for uh, hedging and not so much increasing the activity. Very interesting points raised by both Mr. Reli and Ms. Mehta. But thank you so much, lady and gentlemen, for joining in on this conversation. Now, for now, the takeaway is that the proposal is off the table as of now. But as Mr. Reli highlighted, never say never. So we'll keep an eye out on all the developments uh, as they take place. But the only sector that is in the green this morning, and that is FMCG, and those stocks are surging on the back of their earnings. Manglam is tracking all of them. Manglam, what's working for all of them? Well, uh, if I was to, you know, uh, 
say it in a form of a listicle, I would say FMCG is on fire and here's five reasons why. So let's tell you about those five reasons. The first one, of course, is that there is likely recovery in rural. I mean, look at HUL, it's up around 5%. All the other stocks also, which have a higher rural exposure, you know, the likes of Dabur, etc. All of them doing extremely well. Marico is doing well. GCPL's numbers, that stock is uh, up around 4%. Marico up nearly 10%. So we'll be watching out for Colgate that reports its numbers next week as well, up around 2 2.5%. Rural recovery, that's really that, uh, you know, the street is pinning their hopes on. Why do we say that? Because the last two years, there was weakness. HUL in its commentary, being HUL, the understated, uh, you know, commentator, said they're seeing green shoots of recovery in rural. Dabur went ahead and said their rural business grew twice uh, the size, uh, uh, twice the pace at Urban. Britannia said there's good monsoon and hopes of contained inflation will bode well for recovery, especially post-elections. And Marico as well expects rural recovery in FY25. Does that translate into their growth. Yes, that's reason number two. Growth returns. Dabur is targeting high single-digit volume growth with low double-digit revenue growth coming by. Britannia is gunning for top-line growth. That's what they said in their conference call yesterday. And Marico too expects double-digit revenue growth in FY25. With all of this, uh, inflation is still contained. Managements expect improvement in margins to sustain because of two reasons. One, raw material pressures have abated. Secondly, ad spends have been already ramped up last year by a couple of hundred basis points as a percentage of sales. So there's not much room to increase ad spends beyond that as well. So that bodes well for their margins. And all the trends that were doing well for the last couple of years continue to do well, which is premiumization. So for HUL as well, premium beauty, personal care grew in double digits. Um, we saw good gains coming in for modern trade and e-commerce channels for Britannia as well. And Marico too saw premium personal care grow nearly 2x the entire company's size. And finally, a lot of them are investing in their back end, which is distribution and scaling of acquisitions. Kodrich Consumer said revenue from uh, Raymond Consumer Brands will grow two times the size of the company. At the same time, we will see Tata Consumer scale their chings and organics food uh, acquisitions. Britannia and Marico have announced increase in their offline distribution too. So those are five reasons. Now, the sixth most important reason, these stocks hadn't moved at all. Over the last one year, the FMCG index had moved just 16%. The Nifty is higher by about 25%. And if you compare individual stocks, some of them actually have been negative. HUL, for instance, is down 7% over the last 12 months, excluding today's gains. If you add today's gains, it's still down 2% in the last 12 months. ITC up just about 3% in the last 12 months. Dabur, Nestle, Marico, all of them have been underperformers versus the broader markets. And that's another reason why a turn of events with underperformance in price, that means valuations are a lot more sensible than what they were, say, a couple of years ago. The street is betting on FMCG. Oh, absolutely it is. And I guess it's uh, it's a uh, you know, long wait. Uh, perhaps that's happened. Mangalam, just, just a point again on market positioning over here. Like you said, the, you know, the sector hasn't moved. The stocks haven't moved. So just remind us, I don't want to jump the gun, but you know, in peak valuations, some of these stocks were quoting up to 65, 70 times, right? Average sector valuations, how would they look now versus, say, you know, the peak two years ago? So if you were looking at the peak two years ago, uh, mm -hmm. most of the FMCG stocks were trading somewhere around mid-50s, one-year forward earnings. Now, with uh, them having seen time correction, they're trading around mid-40s to closer to 47, 48 times one-year forward earnings. These are the regular stocks that we're talking about. Some stocks which already, always traded at a premium to the sector were Nestle, which are trading at around 70, 71 times. That's come down to 65 times. DMART, which was trading upwards of 100 times, has now come down to around 85 times. So if you look at it on an absolute basis, definitely they are expensive as against the nifty price to earnings. But that's the FMCG premium, which has always been there. Yeah. But on a relative basis, they've come down by about 20% in terms of the multiples. And that's good enough. Oh, absolutely. This is a real sweet spot, right? Because commentary is picking up, the numbers are showing a bit of a spark, and then you have market positioning on your side. And a market that's wobbly as well. You know, market positioning in a slightly wobbly market, it's a real sweet spot, perhaps, that FMCG is hit. You know, we live in a market where 16% is considered underperformance. <laughs> well, when, you, <laughs> when stocks go up 200, 300%, you'd happily take 16% in any other market. But Mangalam, thanks a lot for joining in and sharing those insights. Time for a short break on Trading Hour. Back on the other side with the management of Indian Bank to discuss the Q4 numbers and the way forward. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.
Back with us on Trading R, and it's time to get into the management of Indian Bank to discuss the quarter gone by. S L Jain, the managing director and CEO of Indian Bank, is joining us. Mr. Jain, good morning. Thanks a lot for joining in. I'd like to straight away ask you about the topic that is in focus, and that is the RBI's uh, draft regulations regarding project financing. And I, what I wanted to ask you is, what's your view on the draft guidelines? If you manage to go through them, how does it impact you and your overall capital requirements going forward? Would that lead to an impact of uh, on elevated pro? provisions going forward as well thank you for having me on the show first is the rbi guideline they talks about the project financing and the guidelines are basically based on the risk banks should have to have a provisions so this guideline will bring discipline into the borrowers to complete the projects in time to have a financial closures because the provisioning requirements are based on the prior to dco dcco post dcco and the post repayment a second point is that they talked about the minimum exposure of 10% more than 1500 crores and all so this will bring a discipline to the to the borrower also and logic quite logical also as far as provisioning part is concerned sir it is it is a draft guideline and we have yet to examine in totality so so uh, you know have you had any back of the envelope calculations i mean uh, since the draft came out just to just to get a sense that if indeed this has to be implemented then what is the you know impact on capital requirement for you so you see basically they, they talked about a prior to dccco 5% and post dccco 2.5% and then 1% right in our, in bank we are having all kind of uh, loan basically in, as far as indian bank is concerned we are having 63% as a retail uh, rem retail agree and msme and around a 37% of the corporate in entire corporate is not on project financing in corporate also we are having working capital we are having term loan right we are having lrd exposure hospital exposures all kind of exposures we are having so this not have major impact on the balance sheet and let 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 this issue be finalized this is only a draft got it got it i understand that but just so that we know uh, as a percentage of your total loan book how much is project financing as you said it's not big but just do, do you have that rough percentage number so that we have to go account by account and understand we have not yet finalized the number but okay. this is the draft guideline we'll send or comments the provisioning part is looks little bit higher but this is based on the risk Yes. So, but we'll give our comments. Uh, provisioning aside, Mr. Jain, just before I get to the business aspect of the bank, are there any capital raising plans on the annual for FY25? So, we our capital adequacy is 16.44 percent as on debt is against the requirement of 11.5 percent, and we have raised 4,000 crore of capital in the FY23-24. And our business model is that that generations are adequate to take care of our capital needs. You see, we we, we were at a six pin. 0.49 last year and and the 23 FI 23 and 16.44 in the FI 24. So in spite of having 13% growth, our capital adequacy is intact. As far as planning is concerned, we'll discuss in the board and we'll come up. Hmm. Okay, so let's talk about the business then. I mean, as I can see the details, uh, your deposit momentum was really strong. I mean. Five percent growth quarter on quarter, almost eleven percent growth year on year. So, I mean, are you comfortable with respect to deposits? And uh, you know, what is the likely growth that you will target in FY twenty five? Let's talk about deposits first. So, at the beginning of the year, we said that our deposit growth will be eight to ten percent in FY twenty four. Is against eight to ten percent, we have grown by eleven percent. The beauty here is that we could maintain our CASA ratio above forty two, domestic CASA ratio above forty two. And now we are, you know, that we are, we are working in a tight, tight liquidity conditions. The point is that the liquidity is available. Pricing is important. So we would like to grow in a balanced way, where we have a CASA ratio of above forty percent. So maintain our uh, cost of uh, cost of deposit. But the money is available, and we think that oh, this year also will grow between eight to ten percent in deposits. Mr. Jain, your slippages were around 1260 crores during the quarter. It was down around 24% compared to the December period. What is your outlook on the slippages going forward? And couple that with your asset quality outlook as well. Have you set any targets so that you want to have your gross NPA at so and so levels by the end of this year? So you see that asset quality comes from your collection efficiency and SMA level. So SMA one and SMA two is only 0.48%. It is coming down quarter on quarter basis. Our collection efficiency is ninety six percent. So the slippage is one thousand two hundred crore, and 
You see, we are continuously telling that our recovery will be more than our sleep pace. You see, our last eight quarter or ten quarter, you see our recovery is more than our sleep pace. Now the and therefore our gross NP and net NP is continuously coming down quarter on quarter basis, quarter on quarter basis. The slippage of 1,200 crore, you see the corporate, virtually there is no slippage in the, in the, in the FI in, in the last quarter. But rather, we have recovered from the NP. The slippage 1,200 has come from the uh, 600 from the MSME book and the, around the 500 crore from the agriculture book. The, in the MSME, around 1,000 odd crore, 100 odd crore is from the restructured book. So this is in, in the small micro accounts and it, it has come. But as far as entire asset quality of the bank is concerned, the net NPA is 0.43, SMA is 0.48. So we are having a better asset quality. Mm. Okay, sir. So let's talk about growth and profitability then. Just uh, give us an outlook, if you can, on uh, your loan growth target for uh, FY25 and also an outlook on margins. Because fourth quarter, despite the liquidity environment that you described, you managed to improve margins. So is 3.4% yeah. a sustainable level for names? Because you just told us about deposits, deposits as well and you're still hopeful of maintaining CASA above 40. So all things put together, an outlook on NIMS and on uh, the uh, you know the growth and advances for this year. So in the last time, what we say that we will grow between 10 to 12 percent in credit in FY24 it is against 10 to 12 percent. We have grown by 13 percent. The beauty of our growth is our growth is a well spread growth. You see our RAM growth, which we call retail, agri, and MSME, has grown by around 14 percent. In the retail, we have grown by 15 percent. In in agri, we have grown by 19 percent. And a corporate, we have grown by 10%. In MSME also, the standard MSME growth is 10%. So we are growing in all segments. Considering this growth and the, the way the economy is growing, we are hopeful that in this current year also we'll grow between 11 to 13%. So this is about the credit growth. As far as margins are concerned, you see slightly the margins have improved for the, for the last quarter because we could we maintain our CASA above 42 in the domestic side. On our art, of course, it is it is around 40 plus globally. And our India year will be to continue this CASA above 40%. And we have a good deposit franchise. We have a 5,800 accounts. We have a we have opened resource acquisition center at some of places. We have a government relationship centers at various places. We are having 12, 13 crore of customer base. So we will continue to control our cost and have a margin at least 3.4 to 3.4. Four, five, because last quarter we were at 3.44% with a plus minus 10, 15 bits. Okay, your uh, investors will like the sound of that, I am sure. Mr. Jain, thank you very much for uh, joining in and sharing the outlook for FY25. Good luck to you with those plans. Well, we do have to take a break on that note. We'll come back on the other side and uh, talk technicals. The market has been facing pressure. So what are the trades you can look at? Mitesh Thakur will join in with some thoughts. Well, 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 the contours of this market are weakening and there's a big slide that's underway specifically in the mid-cap universe, mid-cap and small-cap. Uh, that index has suddenly fallen almost 2%. Now, everything's changed in the last 20-odd minutes. That's the large-cap space for you. That's no better. Uh, that's the mid-cap slide that we're talking about getting really severe. Just to talk about some movers and shakers, I'll start with mid-caps actually because that's where the, the pain really seems to be playing out. Uh, lots of names have been a Vodafone idea, Yes Bank, these are stocks that are down 5-5%, GMR airports all falling on big volumes. Your PSU stars, uh, Aircon, NMDC Steel, Nalco, a lot of these stocks are cracking. Zomato is down 4%, PNB is down, across the board selling on a lot of stocks and these are all uh, heavily traded, high volume uh, mid-cap counters that I'm referring to. So Hormaz, this is uh, this is not a great looking screen. Not a great looking screen at all because and pull up the wicks as well and that is up another five and a half percent. Now it's levels of 17 and a half on the wicks. Those were last seen in October of 2022. Another five percent for the wicks and you remember, Surbhi, on the 23rd of April, the wicks was down 20 percent and all of us were going gung-ho about, oh, the wicks is now below 10. Now it's almost nearing 20. So the volatility abound in the markets. Good time to get a technical check as well. Mitesh Thakkar is joining in. Mitesh, good morning. How do you frame a strategy in a market like this? Because just a few days back, we were talking of 22,800, record highs, 23,000 on the Nifty. And now we are almost down to struggling to defend 22,300. What's your call on the index now? Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, the most important factor over here 
could be the fact that uh, the markets kind of failed at uh, earlier highs. You know, we uh, uh, hit the uh, earlier high levels of uh, uh, 22, 750, 800 zones. And then from there, I think, you know, we started declining. The uh, initial feeling is that it's, it's a breakout failure and therefore, you know, you might uh, see uh, some uh, more correction happening uh, as the uh, time passes by. And therefore, I think, you know, we will uh, suggest people to, uh, one, uh, avoid uh, uh, trading the index and uh, two, I think, you know, uh, wait for some kind of base building to happen before you want to take uh, some kind of directional bias. Uh, of course, you know, you can go short as well. That's one choice. But uh, I am still not sure of a big decline emerging. This looks like a breakout failure and therefore could lead to consolidation. Hence, I'm not, uh, you know, wanting to trade the index. I get that point completely. Just looking at uh, some more levels. Obviously, the 20 DMA is history now. The 50 DMA is in play. Right now, we're trading below that 50 DMA, uh, just a simple moving average. Uh, that comes in at around uh, 22,300 and we're struggling below that right now. And this slide on the large cap space is also now getting more pronounced. It's no longer just a mid cap issue. The Nifty itself is down nearly 200 points and lots of uh, stocks falling more in the last uh, half an hour or so. Hindalco, Sriram Finance, Tata Steel, JSW Steel. Uh, it's really uh, across the board. So you, I mean, you're not trading the index. Uh, Mitesh, would you take any trades, stock trades on the short side then? Uh, I haven't done that, Sulvi, to be very honest. I think, you know, uh, as I said, uh, uh, not very sure that we we'll get into a, a big or a significant decline. This looks like more of a movement which could be, you know, a situation wherein uh, you've kind of failed a breakout, but whether it's a reversal on the downside, I am still not very sure. So, avoiding it. So, what specific stocks are you recommending, Mitesh, this morning? Are there any for the first place? <laughs> no, no, no. There are, I think, say, stock-specific trades are there. Uh, you know, uh, there is a sell on LNT Finance with a stop at about uh, 163 half for targets of around 152. And I've been maintaining that, you know, the FMCG index is the only index which is giving me comfort to go long and trade. Uh, so we had a buy call on uh, HUL earlier. I think Marico, despite the stock being up 9.5%, I would want to give a slightly positional kind of a take. Buy here and accumulate uh, on a 5.6 rupee decline. So your buying range should be about 5.75 to 5.81. And keep a stop below 560 here and look for a target of 620 if you give it about uh, a week or so's time. All right, Mitesh, thanks a lot for joining in and sharing your views on the index and specific stocks as well. That was Mitesh Thakkar as the market goes from bad to worse. But let's look at some stocks as well that are on the move. And Muthoud Microfinance and Fusion Micro are under pressure post their earnings, as are most of the other stocks as well. Abhishek is joining in with the fine print. Abhishek, over to you. Uh, well, both have had a strong business momentum but it seems that provisions that has increased massively on a sequential basis has not gone down well with the street. Take a look at Fusion uh, Microfinance. The disbursers are up 24.5% YOY and about close to 9% sequentially. AM growth is robust at 23.5% YOY and about 7.3% sequentially. They have been able to improve the net interest margin both YOY and uh, quarter on quarter as well. Uh, provisions have increased by 27% quarter on quarter and uh, with the fact that they have of uh, 75 crore in this quarter. So PAT has uh, grown by just 16% YOY and about 5% sequentially. For Mutut, uh, microfinance disbursals are up 18% YOY and 11.5% sequentially. AM growth is robust at 32.5% YOY and 6.5% sequentially. They have been able to improve the net interest margin to 13.5%, uh, which is an improvement seen both YOY and quarter on quarter. Uh, provisions have spiked up by 27.2% quarter on quarter and that's impacted the profitability which is down to close to four percent on a sequential basis back to you all right abhishek thanks a lot for joining in and sharing your, uh, with the fusion and uh, muthut microfinance as well both the stocks under pressure but time for a short break here on trading r up next we'll discuss the market fundamentals anirudh garg from invasit pms will join us on the other side stay tuned we'll be right back Back with us here on Trading R, and as promised, let's get you a conversation going with Anirudh Garg, the partner and fund manager at Invest at PMS, who is joining us now to discuss the market fundamentals. Anirudh, good morning. Thanks a lot for joining in. I was going through your views on the market, and you were mentioning that you are seeing a typical distribution phase within the broader markets, but 
do you see this phase prolonging because we've been in a kind of market where every small blip in the broader market see just as early as a couple of months ago we've seen the broader markets falling 4% 5% in a single day and just within a week they've recovered all of those losses do you see this as that kind of a phase or you do see this distribution prolonging as we go forward a very good morning thank you for having me I think uh, that the distribution phase that we saw a couple of months ago, uh, maybe in February, I think this is not the same thing that is happening. Look at the VIX, uh, where where it is going. It, it's at uh, approximately uh, more than a one and a half year high. And we believe that whenever there is an event coming in, it is very easy to distribute among the confusion. So this is a classic distribution pattern for us that is happening in the market. And I think that the mid and the small caps, which have led the rally for the last one and a half, two years, uh, are bound for big connections from here. Looking at some of those mid and small caps now, uh, by the way, Lupin is reacting uh, to weak numbers. Uh, Andrew, just give us a second. I'm just picking some more stocks because the mid cap index is now looking at a thousand point fall. Let's pull up Lupin down 6%. SRF is now down 7%. Torrent power is down 5%. And these are very well-tracked. They're big stocks. And, you know, they're well-owned by a lot of institutions and, of course, individual investors as well. Uh, there's Aurobindo Pharma, that's 5% lower. JMR Airports, 5.5% down. So it's a long list of losers out there. Uh, Zentech, Inox, Wind. I could just go on and on. But it's a really weak, uh, weak market. Uh, Anirudh, so uh, going back to our conversation, and, uh, you know, uh, you have been telling us that you know, gradually, I think you're shifting away from mid and small caps and perhaps looking to position the portfolio more towards large caps. But how are you going about it? I mean, uh, you know, where are you selling your mid cap holdings? Where do you think the rally is perhaps uh, best done now? I think um, you'll have to look at it from a broader point of view. The entire mid cap and small cap segment uh, based on historical valuations is now trading at uh, exuberant levels, I would say. Uh, we shifted from mid caps and small caps to large caps back in uh, starting to mid-February uh, 2024, and it will be holding large caps since then. Uh, you know, the most difficult thing for a fund manager is to not uh, participate in the very last leg of the most uh, participating or the most rising sector as or the uh, you know, that large, the segment, the large caps, uh, um, we believe that when we shifted to large caps, we believe that the upside in the large caps, at a, we shifted at around 22,000, uh, sorry, 21,400 levels of the Nifty, and we believe that the upside in the large cap would not be more than 10%, but the downside, on the other hand, should not be more than 10%, while uh, in the mid and small caps, the downside could be as high as 25%. So, uh, not willing to take that losses for our investors, uh, letting the last, uh, leaving the last few bucks on the table is what we believe in. We have been holding mid and small caps for the last two years now, and especially CAPEX and CAPEX related themes and interest rate sensitives, the old economy stocks. But we believe uh, currently that they are in an exuberant levels. You know, when your uh, clients, they tell you that if you are participating in the large caps, we would want to exit the portfolio or would ask you to please go into, uh, sorry, when you uh, um, uh, you're not participating in the mid and small gaps uh, that, you know, the desperation is seen is where the markets, they mark their exuberance. And that was a phase uh, that the market saw for the last two months. And we believe it is our duty to, you know, keep the risk reward ratio in check. You know, by the way, Surbhi was highlighting the fall that you're seeing in the mid and the small caps. Now, 93 stocks on the mid cap index out of the mid cap 100 <laughs> are trading with losses. Now, compare that to the small caps, there's no better. 87 stocks on the small cap 100 are trading with losses. But Anirudh, you are highlighting that you are still focusing on some interest rate sensitives and capex plays. And you expect them to do well over the next two years. What within the interest rate sensitives you are positive on? Because most of these real estate names have seen a significant rally over the last 12 months. Auto stocks have rallied significantly as well. The likes of Tata Motors and the Bajaj Autos almost have doubled over the last 12 months. Where within the rate sensitives do you find value? Uh, within the rate sensitives, I believe that the metal should do well. And uh, going forward, if the inflation problem is solved. I see it so, uh, going forward as the time period has passed and the Fed is not, uh, you know, uh, Fed is just contemplating when to give a rate cut and the rate cut, uh, uh, you know, the rate rises out of question. So I believe that going forward, metal should be the flavor for the next two years. And then autos, we believe, uh, 
that have become very expensive, again, based on the historical risk reward valuations, while um, uh, the most one of the most favorable uh, themes, the luxury real estate, we believe um, after a correction, uh, when we buy on dips, would offer uh, a value again. Okay, uh, so uh, so just to sum this up, Anirudh, now you know what's your uh, you know, what's your advice to people as we look at uh, gearing up for election, the volatility, and then what happens thereafter. Uh, and in terms of you know people who are still sitting on a lot of cash and have been waiting for dips to get in, I think that's where it's going to be interesting whether you go back and keep riding the capex themes that, that you also mentioned, or uh, you know is it best to look for some safety, maybe FMCG for instance, where we are seeing buying after a very long time. Uh, I think um, uh, if we look at the overall trend, uh, the overall trend is still in uh, favor of uh, uh, capex and interest rate sensitive. So one should not deviate from the uh, sector, but uh, what one should focus on is going in through SIPs, maybe do the next uh, 10 SIPs in the next 10 to 12 weeks, and whenever there is a decline, maybe double your SIP, and whenever, whenever there's a rise, maybe avoid at that time. Just try to uh, position your SIPs better on, better on dips, and uh, I think it should be good. What you have to focus on here is that a lot of money has been made in the last one and a half, two years. And as important as the generation of alpha in the market, equally important is the preservation of that alpha. So right now, I think the preservation of alpha mode should be on for the markets. Preservation of alpha should be on the mind of investors, but that's a pertinent point that you made, Anirudh. Thanks a lot for joining in and taking time out and sharing your views on the markets and your top sectoral preferences. That was Anirudh Garg of Envice at PMS. Take a look at the markets again. Now, PSU Bank Index is down another 2.5% after the 4% fall that it saw yesterday. All 12 stocks on the PSU Bank Index are down. All 10 stocks on the Real Estate Index are down. And all 15 stocks, Anirudh was highlighting metals, all 15 yeah. stocks on the metal index are also trading lower. The Realty Index now down 3% as we speak. The metal index also at the lowest point of the day now, almost two and a three quarters of a percent significantly lower from the highs of the day. Not looking good at all for the markets. But let's take a short break here. Up next, we get you the latest on the third phase of the Lok Sabha elections that are currently underway. Stay tuned back on the other side. The market is still reeling under pressure and of course one theory is that is this just regular pre-election volatility that has hit the street well speaking of elections today of course is the third phase of uh, polling and the polling of course is underway as we speak uh, and today we are seeing a contest across 93 constituencies in 10 states and two union territories we have uh, Pariksha joining in with some of the key details and some of the most fascinating contests that are taking place in uh, today's uh, phase. Parikshit, over to you. Well, uh, over 33% polling in West Bengal. This is a state which has seen the highest voting percentage uh, till now. And uh, why is West Bengal important? Out of the four seats that are going to polls today, the BJP had won one seat last time around, one went to the Congress party and two to the TMC. So there is a major fight there between the BJP and the TMC to make sure that they retain their vote bank and also increase their overall vote share. Now let's look at the other key states. Let's look at Northern Karnataka. Now there are at least six or seven seats here where the Congress guarantees that is, Siddharamaya's 5-6 guarantees to the people are going to have some impact. At least it's a conversation on the ground. But remember, all these 14 seats had been won by the BJP in the last election. This is the Lingayat-dominated area. You've got uh, the likes of uh, Union Minister Pallad Joshi, who's contesting from Dharwad for a fifth term. You've got former Chief Minister Baswaraj Bomai fighting from Haveri. Jagdi Shetter from Balgaon. Shimoga will be a high-voltage battle that everyone would be watching out for because uh, you've got uh, BJP's B.Y. Raghavendra, the son of Yadurappa, who is uh, fighting from here. You've got uh, Geeta Shivraj Kumar, who is also the daughter of a former Congress uh, Chief Minister. She's fighting from here. And uh, S. 
And a BJP rebel, KS Ishwarappa, is also fighting from Shimoga. So this will be a very important battle to uh, watch out for. Let's move to Madhya Pradesh. Three or four key seats that we are watching out for. I just heard from Digvijay Singh. Digvijay Singh is contesting from Rajgarh. He just told the media that this is his last election. It's now time to hand over things to other people. The 77-year-old two-time chief minister is returning to fight from Rajgarh after 30 years. He's against Rodmal Nagar of the BJP. It's going to be a tough election. He had lost the Lok Sabha election last time as well in 2019. Moving over to Guna. Guna is Jyotirate Sindhya's bastion that he had lost under uh, the Congress regime in 2019. This time, he's a BJP member, a BJP MP, a union minister, fighting against Rao Yadvindra Singh of the Congress party. Let's move on to Vidisha. Vidisha has been a bastion of the BJP for 35 years. The likes of Atal Bihari Vajpayee, Sushma Swaraj have all fought and won from this seat. Shivrat Singh Chauhan is defending his own legacy and that of the BJP from Vidisha. So that will be an important battle to watch out for. Gujarat has been a clean sweep for the BJP uh, for two consecutive elections, both in 2014, 2019. The BJP has replaced about 14 MPs this time, but that's been the trend in other parts of the country as well. The BJP has changed a lot of sitting MPs in states like Rajasthan too. Moving on to Uttar Pradesh. Uttar Pradesh, Manpuri will be extremely important because that's the bastion of Mulayam Singh Yadav. Mulayam Singh Yadav's daughter-in-law, Dimple Yadav, is fighting against Jaivir Singh, Thakur Jaivir Singh of the BJP. He's a sitting uh, MLA from the Manpuri Assembly seat. He is also a state cabinet minister in the UP government, so it's not going to be an easy battle. You also have uh, Akshay Yadav from Pirozabad and uh, you have Aditya Yadav from Badayu. Now, they are uh, the sons of Ram Gupal Yadav, the SP General Secretary, and also Shivpal Yadav, another Samajwadi Party leader. So these are going to be some important battles in Uttar Pradesh. Uh, we're also watching out for Chhattisgarh, where about uh, seven seats are going to polls this time around. Uh, we have seen a big fight in Karnataka over the allegations against Prajwal Rivana. In fact, this morning, JDS carried out protests against the Congress, against DK Shivakumar, the Deputy Chief Minister. So let's see what those allegations really mean for the BJP's campaign, even though the JDS is not fighting any seat in this phase. For them, the election is over. Prajwal Rivana's election is also over. Speaking in uh, Sefai in Manpuri earlier today, I'm coming back to Manpuri. Uh, this is constituency number 21. You had Samajwadi Party leader Akhilesh Yadav saying that poverty, inflation, unemployment are the major issues in this election. Uh, the Prime Minister was, of course, uh, campaigning in other parts of Madhya Pradesh, which are going to polls in later phases. And he has laid out a new campaign pitch. He has said that the Congress, the Indi Alliance is not concerned about national interest or faith. They are only worried about Pakistan. They are more and more eager to please Pakistan and are now blaming the Indian army for carrying out terror attacks. They are not putting any blame for Pakistan. Why do they love Pakistan so much? This is the campaign pitch which is now coming from the Prime Minister against the India Alliance. So earlier it was about inheritance tax. It was about uh, uh, taking the wealth of the people Muslim appeasement, and now it's about Pakistan appeasement on the part of the Congress Party and the Indi Alliance. So let's see what happens in the upcoming uh, phases. But this was a phase where BJP had won a large chunk of seats, 75 seats. Let's see if they can continue their winning streak. Uh, with this phase, half of the Lok Sabha election will be over. Half of the Lok Sabha election will be over. Thanks a lot, Parikshit, for that comprehensive analysis of the third phase of the Lok Sabha polls, polling for which is currently underway. Uh, time for a short break here on Trading R. Up next, we put the spotlight on Dr. Reddy's and SRF, which are expected to share their fourth quarter numbers today. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Back on trading R and let's shift focus to some earnings that will be reported today. One of them is SRF. Sonal is joining in with all the key expectations. Sonal, what's on the annual for SRF? 
Well, it's expected to improve sequentially. The stock though is down around 7 odd percent. I'll get that to get to that later. But let's talk about the estimates first. Uh, revenue is expected to decline 6 percent on a YY basis. EBITDA is expected to decline 16 percent. Margins to come at 21.9 percent. And profits are expected to decline 22 percent to come at 439 crore rupees. So while we are talking the, of the decline on a YY basis, sequentially it is expected to be really strong. Something that we saw with Gujarat Chlorochemicals as well. And this is because some of the orders they were deferred to quarter four from quarter three. Refrigerant prices, they remained weak, but there would be some uptick in volumes owing to seasonality factors and newly commissioned capacities during the last quarter should start contributing to overall revenues as well. And that's why that QOQ uptick. The flora specialty segment will report significant improvement in revenues on a sequential basis. However, the packaging business will continue to be under pressure because of oversupply that we're seeing in the market as well. Why is it that uh, the stock is lower in trade then? That's because Gujarat Fluorochemicals on its conference call yesterday indicated that refrigerant business that is facing headwinds due to duty cuts in US markets and a lot of products are seeing lower uh, realizations as well and one of their major products as well. So phasing out of R22 quotas has also impacted refrigerant gas volumes and that is one of the major products and fluorochemicals business in FI25 is expected to be flat or maybe soften a little bit. Maybe taking cues from that commentary we are seeing that big uh, cut on SRF today but management commentary will be very important to watch out for. Okay, well let's uh, see if SRF can overcome a lot of these concerns. Thank you for that Sonal. Dr. Reddy's will be reporting its uh, quarterly numbers as well. Let's go across to Ekta for a heads up. Ekta, so what are the kind of numbers you're expecting? Well, for Dr. Reddy's, it's supposed to be a good quarter. The revenue is expected to grow around 17 odd percent on a year on year basis, a bit up around 26 percent to margins, uh, translating to margins of around 28 percent, and a profit growth of around uh, close to even 40 percent. Now, it is expected to be a very strong quarter, mainly due to the contribution from the cancer drug Revlimid generic plus the integration of the main portfolio. So, the US business is going to be the key driver. Company is expected to make 100 to 110 million dollars from Rebel Mid Generic versus 105 million dollars previous quarter. Estimated to make around 28 to 30 million dollars from the main portfolio. Now, for the U.S. sales as a whole for Q4, the estimates are wide, anywhere between 300 million to 412 million dollars versus 403 million dollars Q on Q, because there are some uh, who are expecting probably Rebel Mid to slow down and base business pressure. So that'll be important to watch what the eventual number is. My assumption is that it's probably going to be closer to what they did in the previous quarter. Other drugs to help the US growth include generics of uh, Suboxone, Covan, Vesespa. Uh, now watch for price pressure in the US also, uh, as well, the base business performance basically. India expected to grow around 8 to 9%. Russia, CIS could grow around 10 to 11%. Margin range is 27 to 29% led primarily by the US business. Commentary on the Revlimid generic lawsuit, interest in Novartis, US base business, GLP-1 as an opportunity, margins, Russia. These are a couple of talking points to watch out for. We'll keep an eye out on all of these factors. Thanks a lot, Ekta, for joining in. So Dr. Reddy's and SRF, both the stocks in focus. Dr. Reddy is down a percent, but SRF is the bigger one under pressure, down almost 7 percent ahead of its numbers. But it's a wrap on this action-packed edition of Trading R. We leave the markets near the lowest point of the day. But from Surbi, me and the team that put this show together, thank you so much for watching. Halftime Report comes up next.